Welcome to Faith and Science. I'm Dr. John Ashton. Just last week, I, at a time when I was meeting with um, uh, some friends where we uh, meet on a Wednesday uh, night to uh, pray together over Zoom, using uh, Zoom because we're all in different locations. And uh, one of the ladies um, said, look, I was wondering, we need to pray for my husband tonight because he's leading a group of uh, students in in Mount uh, Kosciuszko uh, and they're uh, training in the area of uh, outdoor recreation. And so it was a, a particularly cold night there was uh, snow in, in places, um, just with our local weather <laughs> around. So we, um, several of us prayed that um, her husband would be safe and the students would be safe and he would be able to bring them home safely. Well, as it uh, turned out, um, just the other night, we... Um, invited uh, this lady and her husband over to our place to to watch a, an interesting uh, film called um, Hell and Mr Fudge. And they had been interested in um, learning a little bit uh, more about that. Um, it's um, an, an interesting film and an interesting... Uh, it's a very interesting person, Edward Fudge, F-U-D-G-E. And he was a... Uh, a young uh, theology uh, student uh, studying at a college in America. And he um, was confronted with the, uh, a couple of issues while studying at the college. And one was that God's grace is available to everyone. In other words, and he was very... and he. One of the texts that really impressed him, of course, was John uh, 3.16, that God so loved the world that um, he gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ that would be, that whosoever believeth in him should have eternal life and not perish, or not perish but have eternal life. And um, he was very interested in the concept that it was whosoever were believed uh, in him and should not perish. And this led him to question the doctrine that uh, the wicked burn forever in hell. And as he studied um, very deeply into this um, topic, he found that the Bible taught and Jesus taught that the wicked are destroyed. They don't burn for forever. They don't suffer uh, eternally. But rather, and that God's grace is there for everyone. And so everyone makes a, a choice, makes a choice. God's, God is welcoming um, people from all backgrounds, no matter what they've done to come to him to seek forgiveness for the things that they've done wrong and receive his grace and mercy. And those people who reject this, it was quite clear the Bible doesn't teach that God you know, tortures them forever, that they're punished forever uh, and that they're um, uh, conscious forever in some sort of suffering situation, hell or purgatory, but rather that they are simply, they simply perish, they die. And this we see is a, a merciful dog God and also a way that by choice God allows people that want to be in his kingdom, that want, really want to be good, God offers that salvation because uh, through Jesus Christ, his son. And it's an amazing story. However, a lot of the mainstream uh, Christian churches, of course, were not teaching that. The mainstream teacher, Christian churches were teaching that people suffered eternally um, in, uh, in hell. 
And uh, Edward Fudge was very concerned that that really didn't represent a God of love. That didn't really represent the God that he was reading about in the Bible. He was a very learned character, Edward Fudge. He'd, um, he'd started learning Greek when he was only uh, six years of age. And um, he, he was very passionate about the Bible. His, his father had been a, a radio um, a preacher, had a, a Bible uh, radio program in the United States. And um, so this boy had grown up, gone to college. But because of his um, views um, that, hang on, we shouldn't be teaching that people... Uh, burn forever in hell. Rather, God, they perish. God, they 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 simply die. Um, and he traced that back to um, uh, early teachings from Greek philosophy that taught that the soul was immortal, um, and uh, the immortality of the soul doctrine. And he was able to demonstrate that this was not in the Bible. But he suffered a lot of uh, persecution within, uh, you know, churches for this. And this film, Hell and Mr. Fudge, is about his story. And so these uh, these uh, uh, Christian uh, folk were interested to yeah learn about this. And of course, if you're interested, just um, Google either the film Hell and Mr. Fudge or Edward Fudge and uh, Doctrines of uh, Hell. Um, he wrote several books. Um, he uh, became an attorney um, as well, and he only died a, a couple of years ago, and I think I have talked about him on a previous program. Anyway, we, we watched this film, and after the film, um, David, the husband, he returned from uh, uh, the uh, taking the um, tertiary education students away on their uh, excursion uh, to the uh, Mount Kosciuszko region. And he said to me, he said, uh, uh, my wife told me that uh, you all prayed for us um, last Wednesday. And he said, I'd like to just let you know that we had a very serious situation arise in that it was night time. And four of the girl students had become lost. Um, it was extremely cold. It was dark. And he said this could have become a very, very serious rescue situation. And he said we had no mobile phone reception. We were trying to contact them by mobile phone. We had no reception. Then as we were trying, suddenly there was a window. He said it was a window of only 30 seconds where we got mobile reception. Uh, we were able for whatever the weather conditions were, for just 30 seconds, we were able to make contact with them. And in that time, they were able to, um, David said, they were able to give me their GPS location. And then the phone went off. And using that GPS location and the equipment that he had, he was able to walk. He said it was a two-hour walk uh, to find where the girls were. They stayed at that position and then bring them out. And he said to me, he said, you know, um, we were praying about it um, and we would have been praying just at that time. And he said, you know, I know some people would say it was coincidence, but he said, for me, I would say that's a definite answer to prayer, that that was prayer, that just at that, when you were praying, just at that window of time, we happened to be on the phone, they were, on the, they were able to answer, I was able to get their location. As I read Christian books, there are, are many uh, examples of that. At the moment, I'm reading the book Faith Like Potatoes by Angus Buchan, B-U-C-H-A-N. And he was a Scotsman that uh, migrated to South Africa and set up far, uh, farming and had a powerful Christian experience. As a young man, he lived a very worldly life, but... He had a powerful Christian experience as a as a as a farmer, a conversion experience. When he realised that, um, yes, he had done a lot of things wrong, but there was a loving God that had a better way for his life 
Um, he had a bit of a anger problem and this sort of thing. And um, he prayed to God. He accepted Jesus as his saviour and he was able to get the victory over his anger problem. And he devoted his life then to trusting in God. And in his book, Faith Like Potatoes, he recounts again many answers to prayer and God's providence where uh, he needed to raise some money and they planted this crop of corn that was so dry none of the other farmers uh, planted anything because it was so dry and then the rain came for them and they got a, a bumper crop of corn and similar situation with uh, potatoes and he talks about how at one stage he um, uh, went in in the in the 1980s he went to town there was such a major problem with the um, young babies in particular that were being um, left as orphans by the uh, the rampage of AIDS through the community HIV AIDS uh, HIV through the community and the, the parents dying and leaving these young children and in case babies with AIDS and some of the babies and children had AIDS themselves that had been acquired from their parents and um, there were um, uh, hundreds of thousands of, of children in this situation and um, God impressed him to do something about this and, and to set up just a little orphanage on his farm to at least help some of the uh, children. And he, again, he tells the situation where they pray, God, you know, how can we have the means to do this? And then just at that time, just they found out more or less within a day or two that the local school was um, getting rid of uh, some demountable buildings. And um, uh, Angus was able to have these free just for the for the trouble of taking them away. And he had a farm and he had men working on his farm and so they were able to use their trucks and disassemble them and, and use these uh, demountable school buildings to set up as dormitories uh, for these little children and also another nursery for, for the young, uh, dormitories for the young children and nursery for the babies. And also just at this time, people came into their lives that were uh, qualified people and yet they were looking for something to do and, and they were able to then take up the different positions as nurses and um, carers for these um, children. There were, there were um, just at that time, um, there was uh, another situation uh, occurred where a, another school was getting rid of equipment and um, they were able to get all sorts of equipment that they needed, the... Um, uh, it might have been a dormitory. They were able to get all the beds and uh, so many things occurred right down to things like crockery and cutlery that were provided just at that time out of the blue uh, for them just at that time so that they could set up the orphanage, which is, is still running and being e expanded. And he, he recounts many answers to prayer like this. And in the as he writes about this, he said, some people would say it's coincidences, but how many coincidences do you have to have before you recognise that it's an answer to prayer? And that reminded me of the um, situation with, for example, George Mueller in England, the man who set up the, again, many orphanages in England back in the 1800s, and again, made this vow to God, God, I'm not going to ask anybody for anything. People know um, the situation. I'm just going to pray. And he spent so much time on his knees praying that God would provide the means to uh, house and provide the food and clothing and so forth for the orphanages. And he ran those orphanages and catered for thousands of children over decades all on prayer. The money we, and he in his uh, uh, biography, you read this account after account of he would pray, they would be out of food, and then something would happen and their food would be uh, provided. I remember one story that um, he recounts while they were in the orphanage. They had no food. They had totally run out of food. 
And it was in the morning, it was cold, the children were hungry, and he got the children to sit down at the table and say grace and to thank God for the food that they were about to receive. And they'd just finished grace when there was a knock on the door and there was a baker. And he said, uh, oh, Mr Mueller, look, uh, my cart has just broken down. Can you use the bread on my cart? And this man's cart had broken down just in in front of uh, the door to the orphanage. There uh, are so many accounts uh, like that. I, you know, I think of uh, accounts too just in my own life of uh, experiences of of friends of um, of just the way God can lead and and um, you know predict and provide in our lives. I can remember you know one time when we were on holidays in. Um, in Western Australia, and I may have told this uh, account before as well, where we um, had naively set off on this holiday around Australia in the winter time and up into the northwestern part of Australia, and we're heading towards Broome. And on the way, as we called into a caravan park, we were told, "Well, the um, you know the accommodation is all booked out uh, everywhere." And of course, when we got to Broome, that was the the case, and yet we prayed that we would be able to um, uh, get a spot. And I, I think I've actually told this story just recently. The on one of these programs, we um, decided to go to the caravan park where we wanted to stay, the best one. And we were delayed by different <laughs> decisions, silly decisions that I made. And we eventually did arrive there. And just as we arrived there, my wife went in. The man at the reception was hanging up for a phone call for a cancellation. So if we had have been earlier, we would have missed it. If we had have been later, somebody else would have taken it because they would have notified the Tourist Information Centre. I think of another account where um, in really remote region, we, um, uh, a friend, um, uh, then the vehicle uh, ahead of us that was travelling along, the lady decided, well, was feeling thirsty and realised she'd run out of water and asked her husband to stop and she stopped. And as she hopped out of the car, they heard a hissing sound. They realised they'd just run over some sharp object or rock on the road that had put a puncture in their tyre. And they were able to do the repair... Um, with a little tyre plug, um, immediately. If they had have kept driving over those rough, rocky roads, the tyre would have been damaged and uh, there would have been a, a serious problem. Um, another time, I think, as we were praying for accommodation and we'd been uh, travelling uh, again with the same couple, actually, back from four-wheel driving trip along a road down in, in Victoria... Uh, the ladies were going to a Christian women's convention and we'd, um, I was a member of a, a particular caravan park um, franchise where I could get a, a 10% discount. And so I didn't have internet reception on my phone but the other couple did and I gave them the name of the um, franchise and they rang ahead to the town to book a... Um, a, a, a cabin and when we uh, were getting closer we just th- was thinking we'd, we'd rung out we were running out of time uh, and they might be close so we uh, rang ahead and what happened was the lady got the numbers mixed up the caravan park and she rang the wrong caravan park and found that she had booked a caravan park about 50 kilometres before where we wanted to get to, the town where we wanted to get to. So we thought, oh, well, we might as well go in there. And um, we pulled into that caravan park. And during the night, the temperature dropped down to um, you know, close to a freezing point. As the air pressure in the tyre on their vehicle went down, it burst and due to the weight of the vehicle. 
And when they discovered that in the morning, there was a loud bang in the night and nobody knew what it was. I, mean, I thought it was a gas explosion, but we didn't hear people running around or calling the fire brigade, so just went back to sleep. And in the morning, we found this tyre had exploded and we didn't realise that tyre had been really severely damaged and yet they had been driving at 100 kilometres an hour or so on it. And we felt that it was God's providence that God... And we felt with an answer to prayer and God's providence as we pray for protection that we were directed into that caravan park early had we continued to travel at high speed along that uh, highway with that faulty tyre. Our friends, they could have had a serious accident. So when we look at these various um, situations, we have the, the... There are so many examples of God's protection, I believe, and God's providence in the lives of the Christians that I know, the people that um, I... um, uh, The stories of Christian missionaries, um, you know, like Mary Slessor, the Scottish um, uh, missionary woman who in the 1800s, after reading David Livingstone's inspiring story, went to the Congo area in uh, West Africa and alone as a single white woman converted the cannibal tribes in that area to Christianity and unprotected, unescorted, went in. And there are so many stories like this that I believe the if God is not part of the picture, then how do you explain this? So we have... The major problems in science of trying to explain, you know, the universe, the solar system, life, and science can't explain these. And it, um, you know, sort of gets to me when I hear so much about our education system today is pushing this uh, materialism, naturalism in universities that... um, you know, man is the, the higher power. Man is, um, he's not accountable to anyone. And, of course, we have so many people then coming with this mindset and they want to make some, make you know, they're doing their doctoral studies and they want to make some new discovery, some new contribution. They're passionate about something. And I think so many of the ideas and thoughts that are being promulgated in higher education today Uh, particularly, you know, around um, different issues of morality and so forth, Um, moving people so far away from the Bible and being accountable to uh, a God who loves us and has a plan for us. But the thing is that these um, atheistic views that are dominating in society and our education system, they offer no hope. There's no hope for the future. This life is all there is. And if you're um, born in one of these uh, really poor situations in in a developing country somewhere, there's no hope. And yet as I was reading in Alice Buchan's book, he talked about a little baby that they had, that they received that had AIDS um, and was so thin, like barely skin on bones when he came into their orphanage and they fed him up. And uh, he uh, began developing and growing stronger. But, of course, unfortunately, he still had AIDS. But he was able to enjoy some time on the farm, uh, going around with the children and interacting with the animals and riding on a horse. Unfortunately, the little boy died when he was about six years of age. But as he was dying... He said to uh, Angus, um, and he'd been taught about the Bible, and he used to love horse riding, and he, he, the little boy knew that he was dying, but he was able to say, well, one day Jesus is going to come for me on a white horse and take me to heaven. And this is the amazing hope so that people can have through the Bible. But, of course, we... We can know that the Bible is true, too, through the, the prophecies. When we, we think about the prophecy of Daniel, 
um, that's there in the second chapter of Daniel. Again, a prophecy that was a result of an amazing answer to prayer where Nebuchadnezzar, this historical figure that built the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, had this amazing dream and none of his um, advisors could tell him what the what his dream was and what it meant. He, in order to know that the interpretation would be true, he wanted the, his advisors to be able to tell him what the dream was, and that's you know that's pretty clever. That's the way <laughs> that tests that these people with the claims that they could you know know the future and everything that they were genuine. And the Bible tells us that Daniel, who was a young wise man in training from the captured Druze, prayed to God, and his friends prayed to God, and God revealed to him the dream and also what it meant that the Babylonian Empire would fall to the uh, Persian Empire, which would fall to the Greek Empire, to the Roman Empire, and the Roman Empire would ultimately be divided up into um, strong and weak kingdoms, which we recognise today as Europe, um, and that in the days of those kings, God would return and set up his kingdom. And again, that's a, another example of a spectacular answer to prayer. When you think about it, prayer relates our thoughts, which are non-material, to God, who is also non-material. And we need to remember that the evolutionary theory has no explanation for our non-material thoughts. The theory of evolution just deals with atoms and molecules, so it claims, you know, and that mutations, chemical changes in the DNA produced all the different life forms that we have. DNA is just a chemical. It's just made up of chemicals. It's made up of atoms. They're just dead. Uh, they're just inert atoms that we can chemically join together. But this amazing code is responsible for us. But how did thoughts, how did our non-material thoughts that control our brain? As Dr. Caroline Leaf points out, our thoughts control our brain, just like our thoughts control all other parts of our body. Matter of fact, our thoughts can even construct new pathways in our brain. Dr. Caroline Lee, she's a, uh, a, cogn uh, a cognitive neuroscientist, uh, and her books are, are quite uh, revealing too in this area of the importance of thoughts. And this is what prayer is. Prayer is our thoughts that connect us with God, the God who created everything and who is very real. You've been listening to Faith and Science. Remember, if you want to re-listen to these programs or check the uh, references, uh, just um, Google 3abnaustralia.org.au and click on the Listen button. I'm Dr John Ashton. Have a great day. You've been listening to a production of 3ABN Australia Radio.